No, you can't start a new party now. You're stuck with a big tent opposition to Trump that will regress to the center. If you do start a new party and it is successful, it will either split the left, ensuring Trump wins the second term, or become the Democrats. You need to be fighting Democrats to have any choice of building a successful third party. That's why it was so important that Hillary win and be converted into the villain. So if you're out there, you know, uh, the left of the Democrats thinking this is no. You are now going to have to deal with centrists for the next four years. They're going to steal your podiums. They're going to push you out of the way. They're going to beat the snot out of you. And you're going to watch in disbelief as all of your support aligns with these middling centrist Democrats. They might lie to you a few times too, and maybe you might not fall for it, but your friends will. Non-political opposition in the form of protest and civil disobedience is more important than ever. Because there is no meaningful political opposition for at least four years. And they're going to have no choice but to vote for a Democrat, almost certainly a center-right one, in 2020, in a desperate attempt to oust Trump. So yeah, this is this is a catastrophe, guys. It's really, legitimately, broad-scale disaster. There is nothing left to do but protest, and that will be true for at least the next four years and probably the next 16 years. A lot of the people that told you not to vote for Clinton will be dead by the time that this mistake is reversed. Okay, so people are angry, they're pointing fingers. Regarding who is at fault for this lack of economic power by white people in the Midwest, the system has been designed to put workers in industrial countries in competition with workers outside of industrial countries, then blame the problem on minority groups. Trump is not an accident. He's by design. This is what the system that the Clintons set up intended to be the outcome, right? So of course you don't blame the minorities. But to blame the workers for being losers is to buy into the lie that it's the minorities' fault for taking jobs. No. Okay? The jobs have been shipped to other countries. They've been automated. The competition in the states does not actually exist. And if you actually look at the data, you'll see that unemployment rates amongst blacks and Latinos are higher than unemployment rates amongst whites. So this entire claim that minorities are stealing jobs from white people is a fiction. It is invented out of whole cloth for the purposes of controlling the reserve army. So if you're looking at these white people and they're saying you're losers, you're buying into the lie. They didn't lose their jobs to immigrants. That never happened. They lost their jobs to automation, mostly, and also partially to outsourcing. There's no factory full of Mexicans and blacks hidden somewhere in, you know, under a pile of cheese in Wisconsin. There's a secret factory full of African Americans stealing. No, it, this doesn't exist. This is imagined by right-wing demagogues to control people. So what are you doing when you buy into it? You're just repeating it. You're enforcing it. So who is actually at fault for this? Well, it's the people that designed it. But how do you blame them? Like, they're not at fault for it. This is what they wanted. How do you blame somebody for succeeding at something? I'm going to reread The Grapes of Wrath soon. And I get the feeling that it may be more relevant today than it has been in a long time. Certainly more so than it was in the 90s when I read it in grade 10. And, um... Well, I, I'm sure that I will realize when I reread it that I didn't fully understand it when I was, what, 15? Yeah. 
I bet there's lots of things I write about when I was 15 that I didn't fully understand, right? I'm, re I'm going to reread it for the Ultra Reality. I'm going to read Animal Farm first, but this is the second half of this semester, and that's what I did, was I read The Grapes of Wrath for my independent study. In fact, I read it fairly quickly, in the course of a weekend or so. At the very least, it has to be realized that the solution is to let go of the past and adjust to the new economy, but there is a flip to this, okay? The elite need to realize that the new normal is going to be more people than jobs and adjust to it. What are you going to do with all these unemployed white people in the Midwest? You're not going to find them all jobs. Because that's the new economy, right? It really makes me cringe when I hear these coastal Democrats blame them for their own problems. All I hear is pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps, you losers. That's not a left-wing position. Leftists look at situations, they come up with root causes, they propose solutions. The region needs funding, it needs welfare reform, welfare reform meaning more welfare. It needs retraining programs, it needs a jobs program. In short, it needs massive state investment. And who's going to pay for it? It's you smug liberals out in the coast that are going to pay for it. There's going to need to be a process of wealth redistribution from the coast to the interior. And if you don't do that, you are going to see convoys of Okies showing up in Los Angeles. It's the truth of it. Protests in the cities against the Trump victories. Yeah, that's, that's going to accomplish a lot, guys. They're all centrists. They're reformists. Democrats, you might know, see a couple of liberals out there. If you show up at one of these protests, you're more likely to get into an argument about the Second Amendment than you are to have a serious discussion about revolutionary politics. You're going to have to deal with people that want free market health care, that support foreign interventionism, that want balanced budgets. I'll wait until there's a Democrat to protest against. Thanks. You want to build a big tent movement with a bunch of conservatives and elect another Barack Obama in 48 years? Have fun. No thanks. You think, you, you know all those arguments with middling centrist Democrats that you thought you'd won over the last eight years? Well, you're back at square one now. You'll have to fight all of those battles all over again. I've got better things to do, so call me when you're done. I'll no doubt be within 100 miles of the border. We always are up here. Okay, so let's clarify this point. Polling fail, non-polling fail. Clinton's numbers were within a reasonable margin of error, but Trump's were not. So do not look at the spread. That's the wrong approach. You know, if you look at it, you're going to say, you know, according to the spread, they were within two or three points. But no, that's... <clears throat> The misleading, the correct answer to what happened is that the people polling undecided broke almost 100% towards Trump. Is that reasonable, do you think? There is a polling phenomenon called the shy Tory effect. But Trump is not a Tory, he's BNP. I hypothesize that you might have something like a shy racist effect. Meaning, you know, was there a bias? Might have been a couple of points for a bias. But it's too big for that. Seven points nationally. Ten in Wisconsin. Based on where I had the numbers paid, it would have been ten points nationally. That's a huge amount to assign to a bias. Or you could argue that he could get 70 or 80% of the undecideds. That would be a lot. That would be un unreasonable. In some contests, you have to assign him 95% of the undecided votes. And it's just not credible. What we saw is truly inexplicable without looking to cooked results. But you don't have to look far. Take a step back, guys. Look at the media coverage. It was clearly pro-Trump. CNN, MSNBC, these were very pro-Trump media sources. They gave Trump hours and hours of airtime. Do 
Do you think there weren't people in the back pulling strings that didn't have some kind of motive regarding that? Look at the FBI investigations. Comey. Look at the WikiLeaks releases. These may not have had the polling effects that were intended, but... Okay, so... They did all of these things to try to manipulate public opinion. That didn't work. So they just rigged the election instead. They would have preferred to have people vote for what they wanted, which is why they controlled the media coverage, they floated things through the FBI, they floated things through WikiLeaks, all of these things designed to control people's perceptions of things, designed to manipulate the results. People still prefer Clinton to Trump. So they just rigged it. This was the final Bloomberg poll. I posted here previously, it was representative, but the firms were reporting the data differently. Some worked in the undecideds and others didn't, so it doesn't make sense to aggregate the final polling. You're going to get very misleading results if you try to try to do that. And I said that I'm not opposed to this poll, so long as you read it correctly. It had Clinton at 44, Trump at 41, and undecided at 9. It's the undecided part that was often not reported. Okay. Let's stop for a second, then let's take a detour back to the Canadian election. Um, in some senses, what we saw, what we're seeing here is very similar to my criticism of the Canadian election, but it's not on another way. We saw the numbers break in Canada near the end, okay? It is true that there was a large undecided amount. It was larger than nine. It was more like 20 in Canada. And it stayed undecided for a very long period until the very end where it broke very strongly for the Liberals. But it's very different, okay, for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is because we knew through polling, and it was repeated over and over again, through all kinds of different sources, all kinds of different polling methods, didn't matter who you asked, didn't matter who asked them, didn't matter how you asked them, they all told us that this large number of undecided voters were not going to vote for the Tories, for the Conservatives. When these people said undecided, what that meant was that they were undecided between the Liberals and the NDP. And this was repeatedly demonstrable, rigorously, all kinds of different sources, all over the spectrum, clear as day, that this huge undecided was not going to vote for the Conservatives. And so, it was very clear from very early on in the election that the election would be decided by which way the undecided swung. If the undecided swung all towards the NDP, then the NDP would win. Maybe. I mean, there's there's geographic issues, too, right? It, we don't have an electoral collage, but we have a first-past-the-post system. And, but, but but if the undecided swung all towards the NDP, then the NDP would have probably won. If the NDP split between sorry, if the undecided split between the NDP and the Liberals, then the Conservatives would have probably split the vote. And if the undecideds went all towards the Liberals, then the Liberals would win. Okay? Clear as day. So that's the first part of this. The second part of it. is that they decided, right? It was undecided, you know, up until about a week before the election, maybe a little bit longer, you know, you can check the dates, I don't remember exactly. But by the time we had election day upon us, we didn't have large undecideds anymore. The undecideds had fallen down. And it was clear before the election that the undecideds had picked the Liberals. It's not the case here, okay? We went into election day with all of the sources unanimous that there was about 10% of people that were refusing to tell us who they were going to vote for.
So let's not compare this to what happened in Canada. It's very different for many reasons. But that's what the poll said. Clinton 44, Trump 41, undecided 9. The results were Clinton 48, Trump 47. Meaning that Trump got about two-thirds of the undecided votes, which is quite a bit. Especially considering that it was hard to get him to 40, 41. How did he get to 47? People will tell you that the reason that Trump won was because he did very well with uneducated white men, but the idea of him doing well with uneducated white men was cooked into all of the all of the models. That was not a surprise. The reason Trump won was because he did well with white women. That's what swung the election. And that's the narrative that you need to swallow. Donald Trump won the election because he won white women. Women picked Trump. Do you believe that? Well, let's look at Wisconsin. The last credible poll was from Loris. There were some Republican polls before that. That's right after that, but this is the last you know, non, non-partisan poll. You got Clinton at 44. So I'm gonna. I probably should have done this uh, some time ago. You got Clinton at 44, Trump at 38, and undecided at nine. This is just Wisconsin, and Johnson at seven, which is an exaggeration. So let's let's assume that some of the people that were undecided were saying Johnson for whatever reason. Or if they told, they told you Johnson, but they really, you know, then they got there and they changed their mind, right? So let's, you know, in order to kind of, you know, not deal with that, let's just bump the undecideds up to 12. The actual results were Trump 48, Clinton 47. So Clinton gets, you know, around 2% of the undecideds. And Trump gets 10. Now because of the Johnson thing, you can play with the numbers a few different ways, but it's an awfully high percentage one way or the other. You're looking at 80, 85, 90% of the undecideds moving in one direction. And in fact, if you assign Johnson to Clinton, then you've got to give Trump 100% of the undecideds. Wisconsin's a liberal state. There was no sign of this. Nobody thought Wisconsin... I mean, it was it was a long shot. Do you believe that? And you can make the same arguments in Michigan. So the numbers are there. But do you believe them? Do you believe he won two-thirds of white women? Do you believe he won white male college graduates? Again, we've got this idea, you know, called the Shaitori effect, but I've never seen it used to explain a bias this large, however flawed the idea might even be here. I, I don't think that you can describe Donald Trump as a Tory or his possible supporters as shy. It's not just that the polls couldn't have been wrong. I'm sorry. It's not that the polls couldn't have been wrong in this direction, this way. It's just straining credibility to think they could have been wrong in this direction, in this way, this much. One possible explanation is that Hillary may have forgotten to stuff ballots in Wisconsin, so Trump's cheating seems extra suspicious because it's not balanced by hers. I'm only being a little bit tongue-in-cheek. It would be fitting for the cycle, wouldn't it, if it's true? Likewise, I, would, I see little reason to think undecideds in western Pennsylvania would have been shy Tories. And she demolished him in Philly and Pittsburgh. But that's how you do this, okay? 
The last poll in Philadelphia had Clinton at 48, Trump at 42, and undecideds at 10. The result was Trump 49, Clinton 48, and others at 3. If you just split the others out, right, if you say that, you know, Johnson voters were categorized as undecided in the poll, then you're giving Trump 7 and Clinton nothing. It's only one poll, and I'm not measuring error, but you get the point. You'd have to give Trump essentially all of the undecideds in Pennsylvania. Every single person who polled as undecided voted for Trump. Do you believe that? You could at least maybe, maybe see how lifelong liberals in Wisconsin may have been ashamed about punting social issues for a Hail Mary on NAFTA. But in Pennsylvania, why? Why wouldn't they just tell you they're going to vote for Trump? It doesn't add up. So, I mean, I'm giving you the answer here, okay? You don't need a polling fail. If you read the polls right, you get to the conclusion that Trump simply got a very, very disproportionate level of the undecideds. There's no fail there. It's just impossible to actually believe when you look at what you have to actually swallow to make the numbers work. Things like 95% swings in Pennsylvania, 80% swings in Wisconsin. As well as swallowing the fact that there were 10% of the people undecided the day before the election in the first place. I won't calculate Michigan, but it's just as absurd, no doubt. On top of two-thirds of white women. So, I mean, the, the numbers are there. You can make them work. Barely. But it's impossible to actually take seriously. So I am convinced that this election was stolen by the sheer breadth of it. The likelihood of what you're seeing here actually happening is far too small to admit. That said, if you insist that I come up with a reason for what you're seeing here, if you want to hold absolutely fast to the data, however unlikely I think it is, I'm going to propose that you're seeing a different bias at work. The paranoid gun nut effect. These people will not reveal their preferences to pollsters out of fear of being locked up in a FEMA camp. What I'm thinking is this. You've got, you know, Johnny Gunn fan there out in, you know, nowhere Wisconsin. And he looks on his phone and he sees someone's calling him from New York. And he gets scared. Because of the government. Government's calling me. Government's going to put me in jail. Someone from New York's calling me, asking me about my politics. They're going to put me in jail if I tell them. Because I don't support this Obama. I support Trump. Ten percent? Ten percent of voters? Unfortunately, I think this is far more likely than a Shaitori effect, given the geography. But even so, at 10% of voters, the numbers are just too damned high. If there's a way to make sense of it, it's this. People that are literally afraid to tell people calling from New York or Washington who they're going to vote for because they think that it's the government calling, that the information is going to end up in a file, that they won't be able to find a job, that they'll be sent to a FEMA camp, sent to a re-education camp, 
by that socialist Obama. We're living through very dark times. 